48 science-backed techniques. So the word science is key here. All of the techniques I discuss in the book are backed by scientific research. And that's the difference between when we talk about Greek temples and eras gone by, they absolutely understood the power of place. There's no question, but I think we could characterize it as an intuitive understanding. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker. And this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration and advice while at home, at work or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode as well as free training on creativity over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to welcome onto the show Donald Ratner. Donald Ratner is an architect and the principal of an award-winning architectural consultancy dedicated to maximizing occupant creativity in workplace, residential, wellness, hospitality, and retail environments. An educator and author, as well as a practitioner, his new book is called My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation. It's my great pleasure to have Donald with us today. So welcome. Hi, James. So it's lovely, lovely getting to speak. I mean, if, if ever there was a perfect guest to have on this show, it's probably you, Donald. Uh, oh, well, I'm, I'm flattered, but I do enjoy being called perfect. <laughs> and if I find this, just this morning, I was, I was having a conversation uh, with a client for an event I'm about to hit and do. Um, and it was one of the big uh, audit accountancy firms. And the whole conversation was about space, about creative space and creative places, what makes places creative. So uh, before we kind of get into the book, because th you give some amazing um, ideas on how to make the place in which you're working more creative and how to get the most from, from the space in which you're, you're working and living. Before we get to that part, take us back. How did you get into this world of architecture? Where did your, your love for, for space and, and buildings begin? begin? Well, I, as many people can, I can thank mom for that. My mother, back in the 1950s actually, was a young mother, but was very interested in architecture. And she wanted to be an architect, but you know, in those days, um, raising children often uh, came first before profession. So she had to kind of delay her dream until the 1960s when she actually entered the first class at Columbia University in their Masters of Architecture and Historic Preservation. She was part of the first graduating class there. So she was very interested in historic structures. So as a child, I would be dragged around to all of these, you know, old houses, old buildings, uh, and really made to look at them and appreciate them and would often be quizzed about them, by the way, like, what kind of roof is that? Uh, mansard, mom. And I guess that, uh, you know, inculcation sort of sunk in because when I got to college time, I wanted to leave my nice suburban surroundings and, and go to a city and I ended up going to Columbia myself and was just you know used to ride up and down Broadway on the bus looking at the through the front window made sure I got the seat in the front so I could just look at the streetscape so my interest in architecture really grew from that and when it came to graduate school time I applied and was able to get into Princeton where I studied got my master's and went on from there. And then when did you, so you started getting into the world of architecture, when did you go to really building your own thing, your own name in architecture? Well, I joined uh, a firm uh, out of school, as you know, many junior architects do. You kind of start at the bottom of the ladder, but I spent a number of years in this firm and was able to rise up through the ranks and became one of three partners in what by then was a 50, 50 person firm. And as a partner, I would lead projects uh, from start to finish. And that's where I really began to kind of, you know, find my place in the practice and establish a reputation. So, so now you've, you've written this book about creative spaces, about what makes creative places and how, to, how homes can be and places can be designed to increase levels of creativity. Where did, where did that interest begin? Where did the interest begin for you thinking about how buildings can be much more than a, just a, a functional place in which you live and you sleep and you, you work in, but they can actually have an impact upon your, your creative process? 
Right. Well, I had been about 15 years or so into practice. And uh, up to that point, I was very fortunate in having a lot of high budget projects, uh, all custom designed, which means, you know, I had a blank piece of paper and I could more or less draw what I wanted and have it built. Obviously, I had to fulfill the functions and the client's wishes and so forth, but I really had a free hand. And then one day, um, just through a series of events I had been um, participating in, I fell in with a group of resort developers, but they were sort of an interesting pack because they dealt with, interestingly, historic properties or properties in very unique natural surroundings. In any case, one of the jobs that they gave me was to design a kind of, um, call it a prototype, a four bedroom cottage, which was to go on the grounds of a hotel detached from the main uh, hotel building. And there were to be 30 of them. They would rent out the bedrooms as, you know, basically uh, hotel rooms for guests who wanted to stay in this kind of environment. And the key thing there was they all needed to be identical. So you had 30 identical four bedroom cottages kind of strung around in, in rows. And the decision was made, these being developers, of course, time is money, that uh, the best way to approach this was to build them modular. So for mm -hmm. folks out there to understand modular construction, there is something called stick building, which is what I had been doing up to that, where basically you truck the parts of the building to a site and people there, obviously the work crews, assemble them into a unique object. Modular construction, on the other hand, is where you build, a, let's call it a series of boxes in a factory somewhere nearby so that they could truck them to the site and lower them onto foundations, which is the one thing that's built on site, bolt them together, put a roof on it, uh, add the finishing touches on the outside, and voila, you basically have a factory built building, which you wouldn't even know was constructed that way if you were just standing there looking at it when it's all said and done. In any case, this whole idea of modular construction really got my wheels spinning. I started to think about well, what is the nature of the creative process, especially as it pertains to architecture and design and building. And it started me down a road where I began to look into the idea of co-creativity. So if you think of something like Legos, here you're starting with something that somebody else creates, the little bricks, the little tiles, but taking them, you can combine them in an infinite number of permutations. There is no end to the possible creative output you can uh, produce using a given element. And as I started to look into it, and maybe because of my you know, obvious interest in architecture and space, I began to come across a series of uh, articles, posts, academic papers, books that were looking at the connection between creativity and architecture, creativity and physical space. And the more and more I uncovered, the more I realized, you know, this is something I really need to dedicate myself to and get into deeply and maybe try to find a way to share some of that with the world at large. So this is quite, an, in some ways, this is quite an ancient concept. The Greeks had that, the, uh, the genius loci, the idea that places themselves can have their own creativity, that uh, uh, a, a mountainside can have its own creativity, uh, it can have its own creative genius, or, or a building can have its own uh, creative genius as well. Um, you, when we often, when we think, certainly when I think as someone that's not an architect, I think a lot of house building, I remember living in, uh, we used to live in the Bay Area, and taking that drive from the kind of Silicon Valley area up into San Francisco itself, and then the left there, I'm trying to remember the name of that, that area. There's, a, there's an area that you just, before you get into San Francisco proper, um, you would see all these little uh, little buildings, I guess, little houses. Um, I, I, th I think there was, there was someone who wrote a song. Bungalows, perhaps? <laughs> That's it, yeah. I think even someone, there was a, that famous song that was written, um, Little Boxes, Little Boxes. Um, okay. And I think it was written about this Foster City is the name of this place I was, I'm thinking of here. So it was on the, and, and I thought, I remember driving past these a number of times and thinking, how creative can someone be if they are living in a box, getting into a box to drive to another box, to then come back to eat food in a box, to come back <laughs> and to go back into a box to watch a box, and then going falling asleep in a box. And I just thought it was it was a very it just didn't feel particularly kind of creative. There's very creative things that happen in the Bay Area though. Um, so in your book, you actually talk about shapes uh, as well, and how some types of shapes just have a certain, they do something with us creatively that other shapes don't. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, uh, I guess the best example of that is a paper, a study that was done uh, uh, involving furnishing groups uh, where uh, 
a, a number of subjects were shown images of furnishings that had mostly rounded contours, curved silhouettes, curved details, very soft looking appearance. And they were asked to judge, you know, um, how creative inspire how creatively inspiring being in a setting characterized by such furnishings would be versus another set of furnishing pieces grouped in the same arrangement but characterized by much more uh, rectilinear linear straight crisp edges something you might associate it more with kind of industrial uh, characteristics and the overwhelming preference was for the furnishings that were more curved and rounded in detail. And there were other studies that looked at it in terms of spatial characteristics. So you talk about a box. So images of very boxy environments were shown to one group of subjects versus an interior uh, that was much more curvaceous. The walls were curved, everything was curved. There's no straight lines, there's no right angles. And again, the question was, uh, opposed to which of these two types of environments would be more creatively inspiring. And again, overwhelmingly, the curved interior space was preferred over the rectilinear. So it's funny, you talk about boxes, you know, I always say, look, if you want people to think out of the box, don't put them in a box to think in the first place. And so there's a lot of this kind of evidence where we respond much more favorably to things that have a rounded curved approach. So then I always ask, having discovered these correlations between space and psychology and creativity, okay that's very interesting but why 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 do people think that way now mm. they say in the book as soon as we get into that question these are matters psychological in nature we cannot prove with the same kind of logical certainty why people think or react in the way they do but uh, we can certainly build a case using evidence using data using our understanding of human psychology across the board so the I think the answer here is that it has to do with our genetic wiring. And one of the revelations for me in doing this book was how much we are still cave people, how much our behavior, our emotion, our activity, our creativity takes us back to the first Homo sapiens who appear on the African savanna 190,000 years ago, because the reality is we're not a lot different from them. Our brains are the same size and shape. Obviously, our bodily configurations are very similar. So because evolution moves so darn slowly, it hasn't caught up to the fact that we're living in a modern industrial society, not on the African savanna mm -hmm. anymore. But we still get these lingering, uh, these vestiges of emotional responses. So going back to the curve versus straight question, I think if you imagine yourself, what, sitting down at the breakfast table in the morning, you got a bowl of cereal, and you, what are you doing? You're ladling it in to your mouth with a spoon. You don't think twice about that spoon hurting you because it's curved, it's rounded, you can deal with it. But if you stand up and walk over to the countertop and say you've got a lemon or a tomato or a piece of melon, whatever, and you need to cut it, you need to slice it, what are you doing now? You are very focused on what you're doing because you know what that straight edge can do to your finger if you turn your head away, if you don't pay attention, if you take your mind off it, you can hurt yourself. So we are wired, in essence, to be wary of things that are straight. If you think of animal teeth are very sharp or rock, uh, jagged rock edges. If you're walking along in the cliff uh, in somewhere in nature, you don't want to fall and hurt yourself because you know those rocks are going to uh, be harmful to you. So our whole being is engineered to survive and thrive, obviously. So we're much more relaxed in, in the presence of curvilinear elements, curvilinear furnishings, curvilinear space. When we're relaxed, we tend to be more uh, willing to take risks. We tend to be more willing to explore into unknown territory because we feel safe. And that's the kind of environment that creativity thrives in. So just in this very subtle way, just the presence of straight lines versus curved, boxes versus open space, more welcoming space can change the way we think. I mean, someone listening to this now saying, you know, Donald James, that's, that's all very well, but it sounds a little bit woo-woo. But then we look at buildings like the Bloomberg building in London that recently opened, which I think we spent over a billion pounds or a billion dollars on that. And I remember looking inside of, of, in that building and the build, I think it was, a, it was a Norman Foster, I think, in Partners Building. Um, but inside it, you all the, you, it's, essentially it circles within circles. Uh, the, the, there's a circular staircase kind of going up, but then the, the areas in which people work is circular rather than those kind of rows of desks that we often start, uh, think of, or, you know, the corner, the uh, corner offices, uh, for example, it's these little circles. And I thought what was interesting about it was the way that they designed the circles in the, in the, the workspaces that they have 
those times, I'm, I'm sitting on a slightly curved desk just now, where people can do their individual focused work, but then if they turn around, there's a circular table in the middle of these circles, which is where they come together to you know discuss ideas, to you know collaborate, to brainstorm. So that so you can see how they're they're using that in the structure of the of the furnishings as well, not just in the in the building. Absolutely. So I just want to go back to your woo woo comment. Um, <laughs> it's very important here that there's kind of a sub subtitle to this book, which is 48 science backed techniques. So the word science is key here. All of the techniques I discuss in the book are backed by scientific research. And that's the difference between when we talk about Greek temples and eras gone by, they absolutely understood the power of place. There's no question, but I think we could characterize it as an intuitive understanding. Whereas from the late 1960s into 1970, there develops a science called environmental psychology, which is just what it sounds like. It's the study of how place, whether it's built or natural, influences how we think, feel, and act as human beings. It is the science of person to place interaction. And it's a very serious study. It's subjected to all the same you know, rigors and scientific protocols of any other scientific discipline. So everything I talked about is backed by science. It doesn't mean we always have the right answers or we're understanding it correctly. And there are certainly cases where science cannot be, uh, experimentation cannot be replicated, but there's a lot of hard information here. Um, getting back to your description of the uh, Bloomberg interiors, yes, the way space or the way furnishings and space organizes people relative to each other has a huge impact on creativity. So let's talk about the most common uh, idea space I think you'll find in most business environments, the meeting room, the conference room, the idea room, innovation room, whatever you want to call it. What is the shape of that room? First of all, it's that box again. 95% right? likely, and I'm sure you've been in many of them, they're rectangles, so already we have a problem. But there's a second problem, which is the table inside the room. It's an elongated rectangle most of the time. Mm -hmm. I've looked at you know, Google survey uh, information, but it's 90, 95% of the time it's a rectangle. Sometimes it's an ellipse or maybe a rectangle with rounded edge, but it's generally, let's call it a rectangle. So what happens here? Well, people sit down and we're gonna have ourselves a brainstorming session. The problem is there's a power disparity going on in terms of how people arrange themselves around this table because who's sitting down at the end? It's the, the team leader, it's the CEO, it's the project head, somebody with authority. So when that person has an idea, throws it out into the mix, how do you think it's going to be received? On the whole, very likely it's going to be received very well because, look, it's, it's just human nature. It's the nature of the political structure within the organization. Um, you generally will give a more favorable uh, uh, impression towards an idea coming from down at that end. Let's now take the same idea and give it to the person who's sitting way down in spatial Siberia in the corner of that table. Well, you know what? That's the junior exec or the newbie or someone who's just kind of in there. Uh, maybe that idea will fly, but maybe it won't. It's the same idea. And yet because of where it's coming from, who it's coming from, where they're sitting on the, t on the table, their proximity to power, it gets evaluated differently. And that's just what you don't want in a creative environment. You want ideas to be evaluated on the basis of their merits, not on who had them. And this is not woo-woo stuff again. They've actually done studies in jury rooms, right, where you typically have that 12-person rectangular table. I've had the pleasure or displeasure of serving on juries myself, so I know this for a fact. They've actually um, monitored, recorded the nature of the conversation, the nature of exchanges between people depending on where they sit. And it's a whole different dynamic whether you're sitting at the head in the middle of the long row, the one seat to the right of the middle of the long row or left, or in the corner. So this is real human dynamics. And you talk about curves. Well, just think about it. if you're sitting at one of those rectangular tables and you're in one corner and you need to speak to the person who would like to address the person person in the corresponding quarter down your row, what do you have to do? You have to stick your head out, look down the row, you know, and then kind of sit back again. That's going to discourage communication, exchange of ideas, whereas the person right across from you, very easy, there's more likely to be that kind of communication. So the disposition of people has a huge impact on creativity, on discussion, and the way the ideas are taken. Now, take that same room and let's make it a circle. Let's put a circular table in it. Now what happens? There are no hierarchically privileged seats around that circle. 
they're all the same, they're all equidistant from the center of the table, so that all the ideas now go into what's called an idea basket in the middle of the table where they can be evaluated equally, fairly, rather than all the attention, all the energy focused on the periphery. And psychologists have even come up with two different terms to describe these arrangements. One is called sociopedal, which is a um, uh, mashup of social and septripetal, which of course represents the idea that your focus and energy is on the periphery of the configuration down at one end versus sociofugal, centrifugal and social, which is talking about how energy is focused towards the middle. And by the way, these two terms were part of um, the work of a fellow named Humphrey Osmond, who was an Englishman actually, uh, working in the 1950s uh, in particular, and he got into this whole area of what's called proxemics, which is the nature of how space and personal interaction influence each other. And he's very um, influential in this whole study. Uh, he's also the fellow who um, uh, I think gave um, Algius Huxley, or no, let me see, I'm trying to recall, recall now. Oh yeah, he's the term, he, he coined the term psychedelic. He hung out with Timothy Leary and all these other people, but don't think of him as woo. He's a very serious uh, scientist who really uh, explored this very important issue. So this is, I mean, because as you're talking about this, I'm thinking, um, as we're filming this today, we have some interesting things. I'm in the UK today, and we're having some interesting things going on in, in British politics uh, at the moment. And I think of the down, 10, number 10 Downing Street. Um, I think of the, the, the cabinet room. And that's a room exactly like you've just described. It's a room, the, the, one of those kind of long tables. The sent person, um, the most senior person, the prime minister is in, in, the, in the middle there. And everyone's kind of crinking their necks. And, and, and I contrast that with, let's say, the CERN in, in Switzerland, where if we look at there, you, it's once again in circles, you see all those, that circular motif coming back and everyone is seeing up-to-date information tools right there. There's data, there's live data. And I think about Downing Street, for example, um, there is no live data. There are no tools there. The only, the only tool, I, I think there's two tools in the room. One is a clock, which doesn't work actually from friends of mine that have been in the room. And the other one is a fireplace where sometimes the prime minister will scrumple up the things as he's been given by some of his cabinet ministers and throw them in the fire to burn them. But that's the only tool. And I, I look at those two different rooms and knowing nothing about, you know, the areas that you, you're supposed to be just kind of learning about this now, I'm thinking, wow, you know, that those rooms have been set up with specific goals in mind. Uh, but if you're looking for creative ideas to come out of a space, I'd much rather be in the CERN rooms than I would be in, in Downing Street. I'm guessing you're going to get more creative ideas coming from, uh, from CERN. Yeah, no question about it. And um, just in terms of mentioning government uh, functions here, when I think of uh, images of, you know, where um, two teams are coming together to negotiate a treaty, let's say, uh, maybe there's just an inclusion of a war or a conflict, very often you'll see them sitting at this long rectangular table, but they're absolutely just facing each other, right? They're just li literally looking across straight at each other. You cannot describe a more adversarial uh, condition uh, that is unconducive to the idea of negotiation, right? Because you're just battling, your, in a sense, you're, you're recreating the conflict you're trying to get out of by having yourself facing each other in this box of a room directly. So uh, time and time again, we find that space absolutely does change how people interact with each other, how they think, how they feel. Uh, one, for example, <laughs> interesting little study found that uh, you know, in car dealerships, uh, when you come in to negotiate the, you know, the price of the car towards the end of your visit there, if, they, um, uh, if, if the car dealer had a, had, has placed a seat opposite their desk, you know, wherever you're talking to the manager that has, say, a soft cushion, softness, they, people in those seats tend to be less, shall we say, hard ass in their negotiation and are more willing to take a better price or price more favorable to the car dealer. Whereas if you put in a hard seat, they become harder negotiators. So it's just amazing mm -hmm. on how much uh, how and how subliminally we are often not aware of the effects of space on us, which is part of their power to influence us. So, so knowing what you know as you were kind of going through this book, being and it's because obviously it's science is evidence based as well. Uh, if we go kind of a little bit meta here, uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about the process of writing this book. And I'm, I'm interested in, in, in from two different perspectives. One was 
who were you who were you writing this book for who's your ideal reader for this book the process of actually writing um was like the, the kind of i guess the marketing the business book part of this but then also the creative process part of it as well where were you writing it where were you thinking about this book where were you doing your research how did the places in which you were creating knowing what you know influence the writing of this book Right. So in terms of the reader here, I'm, I'm straddling two worlds. First of all, I'm dealing with people who are not necessarily themselves design professionals like myself. Uh, so I want this book to be understandable by everybody and anybody who's interested in improving their creative test performance. So it doesn't matter whether you're in a professional um, uh, area of creativity or you're doing this from a personalized level. It's written in such a way uh, that anybody can take it and apply the lessons they're in. But of course, I'm also interested in reaching my fellow design professionals because honestly, this material is not taught in schools for the most part. You have to look far and wide to find a course in environmental psychology in any school of architecture or design, which is unfortunate uh, and I think needs to be remedied because we need to be more cognizant of how buildings influence who are ultimately our clients, really, which are the users. Um, so uh, as far as um, where I was writing this book, well, it won't, won't shock you to know that I was writing it at home um, because I'm a home-based creative myself. So I kind of live and breathe the, the subject matter here. And I have, you know, set up uh, creative spaces within my home to reflect many of the techniques that I talk about in the book. I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. So I'm lo and I'm looking behind you just now from what you, you know, um, you know, I'm looking around you as I see just now. And sometimes we, we think of, you know, we think of these kind of almost like Apple, you know, uh, um, Joni Ive style space. Everything's very clean. There's nothing on any surfaces. Uh, which looks very futuristic, but I often think they look the least creative type of places. Yes. Uh, so t tell me about, you know, actually what you have around you, um, what you look out onto, how you, perhaps even how you position your desk, uh, where yes. you write, how does that influence your creative process? All of those are uh, factors definitely that I talk about in the book. So you're, one of the things you're probably seeing right now is the color green. Yep. So there have actually been studies, uh, once again, where people have been, it's called priming. So uh, in some fashion, uh, subjects are exposed to some external cue, some visual or auditory, anything that can be channeled through the human senses into the brains that might then trigger some kind of an association or connection or response based on memory or what have you. So the color green has been found to prime people for uh, increased creativity of test performances. Why is that? Well, I think the most obvious answer, certainly proposal for an answer, is that it mimics nature. So nature is a huge creativity booster. This has been demonstrated time and time again. And it goes back to you know our earlier discussion about how we are basically rooted in our genetic engineering, how our past is our future in a lot of ways because our bodies were configured entirely to exist in a purely natural environment. It was no other kind 190,000 years ago. And it's only when we started in the last 001% of time, of the history of time, to come indoors 90% of the time that we've been separated from nature. And as a result, we suffer a lot of... I think physical drawbacks, uh, everything from depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, even cancers have been linked to these nature deprived environments, which I'm afraid to say does include many an Apple uh, interior space. But it's interesting, by the way, they're starting to move away from that aesthetic I see in some of their most recent product offerings are starting to go back into that more colorful, playful aesthetic. So even they may be reconsidering that um, that uh, design direction. Um, another thing you may see in uh, the background here are mementos, right? Because we're in a home environment. So interestingly, they found that people who contemplate past events, um, things that happened to them in years gone by, actually increase their creative output, increase their idea flow. And the theory here is something called construal level theory. Uh, so this is the idea that the farther away you perceive something or an event or an object, the more abstract, nonspecific, broad brush, big picture your mindset becomes. And the way I like to illustrate it to folks when I give talks uh, to people around the country is imagine yourself up in an airplane, you're flying over, let's say, mid-America, which is you know, largely farmland, and you're at 10,000 feet or whatever it is, and you look down, what do you see? 
see these big swatches of color, their farms, their fields, but it's really very abstract to the eye because you're too far away to absorb the detailed information you need to know, well, what kind of crops is that? And what am I looking at over here? It's just pure light and shade, color and different colors and patterns and things of that nature. Now parachute out of that plane and you come down to the ground, you can say, oh, look, there, that's a wheat crop. I see a John Deere tractor. I can see the scratches. Now your mindset is much more analytical, meaning you are very focused, very detailed. So these two kinds of what are called cognitive styles, analytic, which is that kind of rational side of our brain, uh, which is very linear in the way we think, very, um, you know, uh, specific, versus that abstract, broad brush, literally big picture when you're up in the air. That's how you brainstorm, right? You don't hunker down into, well, let's get into the details before you've even invented mousetrap. There's a new mousetrap trying to create. You start with the big picture and you hone down to the level of detail much farther on in the process. So by thinking of, you know, family and ancestors and times gone by, you're actually putting yourself into an abstract mindset that enables ideas to flow much more readily than when you're too focused on things. So even those little decorative touches can change the way uh, we think. Now, I'm also fortunate you're looking in one direction towards the interior of the space, but I'm looking in the opposite direction. What I see outside my window, because of where I am, is an enormous amount of foliage of trees. And this, again, gets back to that idea of nature. I was just talking about connecting with nature, obviously, visually, but I can smell it, I can taste it, I can almost touch it, I can almost taste it, I can touch it. Um, that, that has restorative capacity to uh, the brain that's very important. A key thing that I found throughout the book is that human health, human happiness, and creativity all tend to operate on the same spectrum. Whatever environmental conditions promote the one tend to promote the other, so those things which restore our health, the idea that you know, life is sustaining, creativity is possible, such as views of nature, will also help us with our creativity and with our general happiness as well. And what about the, the, the so you've talked about the, the physical environment, the, the things you're often touching, you mentioned the things that you're, 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 you're smelling, you're seeing, what about the things that you're, you're hearing? Because some, sometimes, I, I know for me personally, sometimes I'll be working away a little bit what you mentioned there about focusing, uh, I suppose John Cleese from, uh, from uh, Monty Python, he often talks about focusing and defocusing and that's in the abstract right. and the, the analytical. Um, sometimes I have to go into spaces which have, and not quiet, but are not loud, but they, they have a certain level of, of a buzz or hum to them, like a coffee, certain types of coffee shops, for example. Maybe there's no music because I, otherwise I get triggered about listening to music, but there's a, something kind of going, going on in the background that kind of puts my brain at rest a little bit. Uh, what have you found in terms of how sound and how uh, our ears um, and where we, we are, how that can affect our levels of creativity? Yes, so you are touching on technique number 17 uh, in the book. I've given them each a number uh, because the way I've structured the book is to literally have 48 techniques. These are all following an introduction to kind of lay the groundworks. Each have a number. They have a little phrase as to what it is they're going to be about, and then they go into a series of steps. You know, what is it that you want to do to bring out creativity using this tactic, how to do it, why does it work, and uh, other tactics that relate to it. So this is number 17, it's called Make Noise. So, you know, interesting, if you ask most people, what's the ideal, you know, auditory environment for creativity, most people go, oh, well, like total silence, right? Well, not according to the data necessarily. According to the data, this comes from a University of British Columbia study, um, they have found that 70 decibels is actually the sweet spot for ideal uh, idea flow. And 70 decibels is about, you mentioned coffee shop, you know, if you walk into your favorite coffee shop on a moderately busy day, there's background chatter, that's probably gonna be around 70 decibels. A shower, when the water's kind of beating on, you hear that noise, that's about 70 decibels. It's a little louder than obviously just one person talking, but not so loud as to be hurtful to your ears or distracting in that sense. But two key things here, one, it has to be white noise. Um, that is, it's unintelligible uh, background um, uh, noise that doesn't have a specific you know, content to it. So background chatter is good, but also uh, uh, running water, as I mentioned, 
Um, a fountain, for example, would create white noise, ocean waves, even the rustling of tree leaves under a breeze would produce uh, that kind of white noise because what you're looking for here is just enough distraction of a good kind that takes you out of that focus kind of self-aware state when you become aware of that you're aware of your what you're doing but not so much as to just kind of drag your mind uh, into a place it doesn't want to be or is hurtful or painful or anything of that sort so interesting now i should mention here that with all of these techniques these studies are done with multiple subjects obviously because what we're looking for here is a kind of ideal avatar in a sense that is a general population you yourself you might have very sensitive ears and yeah. you would find 70 decibels actually bad. A famous example of that is Marcel Proust, the novelist who was uh, crazy uh, sensitive to noise. He would uh, close the French doors in his Paris apartment, draw the drapes, put in earplugs. He lined the bedroom, which is where he worked. He lay in bed while he was writing 1.7 million words in his, uh, in his monumental novel series with cork so as to absorb sound because this is someone who couldn't let any, couldn't filter any noise out. So that's an extreme example. But for most of us, 70 decibels will be just the kind of sweet spot you want to write. Now, there is music. So, you know, this is interesting. Music is another tactic I talk about in the book. Uh, for some people, music is a positive stimulus. But the key here, again, is it has to follow certain conditions. So if it's uh, a song with lyrics, for example, there is a tendency for us to turn too much of our attention to hearing the lyrics, unless it's a song you've heard, you know, so many times, those lyrics just, it's just, they pass you by because they're absolutely ingrained in your memory. So instrumental music is generally more positive. Obviously, it should be task appropriate in terms of its timbre and its genre and so forth. And it's got to be music you like. <laughs> if you don't like it, then you, you know, you're in a negative uh, state of mind, and that's something that runs counter to creativity. And I've heard some, especially authors, who, uh, while they're writing a book, they'll uh, they'll actually play the same album over and over and over and over again because they, they can just they, they, after hearing it so many times, they're not really listening to it. It's just creating exactly. a, a, a bit of a soundtrack um, to that as well. So, fa so this is fascinating. I mean, you're giving so many. I mean, we've just touched on a couple here. And in the book, you have obviously lots of these uh, different ideas to be able to share. And all, they're all uh, supported by evidence, and as you say as well. Um, so let, let's just, as we start to finish up here, a couple of kind of quick questions for you. I'd love to know, um, we haven't really spoken so much about tools, you know, actual physical tools or online tools for, for the creative process. We've almost been thinking about the space as a, as a tool. Uh, but when it comes to other tools, let's say uh, physical things that you have around you, books or new journals or online apps, for example, are there any that you find particularly useful for doing the type of creative work that you do? Sure. Well, certainly, you know, mentioned books and, and sources of information. So this is all about, in terms of writing this book, gathering information. I have to go because I'm not writing experiments myself and because they expand so many different uh, subject areas, I need to bring in outside expertise, obviously. So books are important source, academic journals, popular press, scientific press, and so forth. In terms of online tools, one I could certainly recommend for anybody who's doing any kind of writing, it doesn't have to be a full nonfiction book, could be fiction, could be blog posts, anything, is an app called Scrivener. Uh, the word Scrivener was a uh, it's kind of now obsolete term for writer. Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener is a classic Melville story about a, a clerk who does you know mostly writing in his in his work. Uh, anyway, it's an app that is specifically designed for writers. So it's structured completely different from let's say Microsoft Word or even Google Docs, which are trying to be you know many different things to many different people. So it reflects more of how writers think, how they work, in a sense, even the digital space is organized more favorably to say, if you want to write chapter by chapter and then move some chapters around, you can do it easily. I heartily recommend it to everybody and anybody who's doing any kind of writing in their professional or personal work. There are both Mac and PC versions. I think it was born in Mac land, but I do believe there is a PC version as well. The other one I can suggest is uh, an email program uh, called Spark. And this one I'm not, I know it obviously it's in a Mac platform. I'm not sure if it 
comes in the PC version. But believe it or not, it's actually so well engineered that I'm starting to make it a possibility at least that email will be my sort of work hub you know most people are like running screaming from email because it's so overwhelming and it's kind of a broken system on some levels but this one is engineered so well that you can actually almost uh, uh, converge uh, tasks that are being performed by other apps in one place which i always find to be much for useful so i would definitely recommend looking at that as well and if you were to recommend one book not one of your own books but a good book in terms of people that are interested in creativity more generally what would that book be oh that's a tough one james you're almost asking me to pick my favorite child which you know <laughs> is totally unfair um i, I would say you know one uh, a good book certainly for people kind of getting into the subject would be The Myths of Creativity by David Burkus, uh, B-U-R-K-U-S. I think it was a, was he a guest on your program. He was, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. David, David's a good friend. We'll, we'll put a link here for the show notes for the oh, wonderful. we did as well. Wonderful. Yeah, I recommend this book because in a lot of ways, it, um, it just what it sounds like, it clears away a lot of the misconceptions about what creativity is and isn't. And I, that's a very good thing to do because a lot of kind of public perceptions about creativity turn out to be maybe not so right. So to kind of get yourself on a good footing get to get into the more positive aspects of what it's all about, I would suggest that, that book. Fantastic. And as you've been going along your own creative journey and, and writing this book, researching around this as well, and also in, in your architectural practice, was there a key, I guess, a key aha moment or insight or, or a time you made an important distinction in terms of the type of work you wanted to do and impact that you wanted to have in the world? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess if I were to look at a kind of a seminal moment that prompted me to really feel like this book was, you know, worth the enormous effort it takes to put a book out there, I would say is when I came across a very interesting study done in 1984, um, is run by a medical biologist named Roger S. Ulrich. And uh, what he did was to go to a hospital, um, it was about an hour north of where he was, he was at the University of Delaware, it was west of Philadelphia. And he started to pull the records, not started, but he pulled the records of a group of subjects, patients in the hospital who all shared certain characteristics. They were all there roughly the same time. They were all in for the same surgical procedure. And most interestingly for the book, they all stayed in identical rooms on the second and third floors of one particular wing in the hospital. And they were all on one side of the corridor, which means they were all looking out in the same direction through their window when they sat in bed. And the only difference in their environmental conditions and their profile was what they saw through the window. Roughly half the subjects, when they looked out, they saw the tops of trees that had been planted in a courtyard just outside their windows and that obviously had grown up and at this time would have had uh, greenery along the branches. The other half, just they were farther down the corridor, I guess, and they hadn't planted trees all the way down the courtyard. So when they looked out, they saw a blank brick wall of an opposing wing on the other side of the courtyard. And the question Ulrich asked was, well, did this environmental cue, this trigger, in any way influence patient outcomes? Everything else is the same. And he looks at these records and lo and behold, he finds there was indeed some striking differences. Those who saw the leaves on the trees had shorter hospital stays, uh, stays uh, experienced fewer complications, required less medication than those who looked out at the brick wall. So boy, when you think about that, if you have any doubts that environmental psychology is just you know snake oil, this should put it to rest because here you have something outside the human body literally altering the healing process almost to the point where you, in a sense, environment can influence life and death. And for me, that was kind of a light bulb moment. Everything else sort of flowed from that. There was no question anymore that this was a subject worth studying. And because I was interested in creativity, I honed in specifically on that relationship. Fascinating. What a fascinating, fascinating studies. We'll have all the links here for everyone who want to go to the show notes and they can see some of the links here that we're, we're talking about. Um, a final question for you. I want you to imagine that you woke up tomorrow morning uh, you can wake up in beautiful Connecticut where you are today and you have to start from scratch. No one knows who you are. You know, no one, you're going to have to begin again. What would you do? How would you restart things? Well, James, I'll tell you, I, I may be one of the few guests of yours for which this question is not a hypothetical um, because dial back to, you know, the dark days of 2008 uh, and the financial crisis and so forth, it hit, you know, obviously the world of architecture very heavily because by nature it's a, it's an expensive undertaking. Um, 
it's a long-term investment in the future to put that kind of time and resources into creating physical space in many cases. So I was pretty heavily hit to the point where I really uh, had to close down the firm and um, go in a different direction. So the road ahead was obviously blocked and nobody was initiating new projects. That certainly wasn't the case. I could maybe pedal backwards, but you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You can't see behind you for one thing. So to sense the only directions I could go in were sideways, uh, which is say kind of engage in some lateral thinking. Uh, what are the areas that are of interest to me, but just as importantly, how can I build on the one thing you left me with, which is my knowledge. That's the key asset that I kind of still holding on to. And where can that take me? And I did, you know, spend a good bit of time exploring related areas, whether it's fine arts or product design, before kind of discovering this information, connecting creativity and environment. In a sense, it brought me a little bit back full circle because I was back in the world of physical space again, but taking it in a whole new direction. And because there are so few people in the world, for some reason, I know all my colleagues in this area, I can count them on one hand and maybe a couple of toes. Um, it's in a sense, it's, it's open waters and I feel like I can make a meaningful contribution that um, will help others as well. Well, it's a fascinating area. It's um, the fascinating book, all the, the different um, experiments you, you share in the book as well. So it's called My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation. We're going to have a link here below. People can go and get their copy of the book. And if people want just to reach out to you in general, Donald, just maybe to ask you other questions or find out what else you're up to at the moment, where's the best place for them to go and do that? Yeah, come to my website, donaldratner.com. That's Ratner with two T's. There are some one T Ratners floating around. I don't know where they came from, but we're in the two T camp. So check it out. There's a lot of resources uh, on there that might interest folks. And by all means, yes, reach out to me through the contact page. And I'm also on LinkedIn as well. Well, Donald, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, learning all about creative spaces, creative places. I wish you great success for the book. And thank you for coming on and sharing all about your creative life. Thank you, James. It was fun. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.